how many people here on the space are uh, familiar with your your background. So maybe start off with a little bit of context around who you are, how you got so involved in the dividend side of investing, REITs in particular, and we'll go from there. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And it's great to be on this this uh, channel here. So I've been in real estate for, oh man, 30 years or so. Uh, I've started out in, in the uh, brick and mortar side. I, I was a developer for uh, over 20 years and uh, built built a lot of buildings for a lot of growth uh, companies like Advance Auto Parts, so Riley Auto Parts, Walgreens, CVS, and Walmart. Uh, so I did that up until uh, the Great Recession. And of course, you know, and many of you know what happened in the Great Recession. And so I uh, kind of changed direction. Instead of uh, focusing on real property, I, I uh, pivoted to intellectual property, which simply means, Michael, and this is how we met, by the way, uh, I became an analyst uh, covering the real estate sector. Uh, I used to sell shopping centers and freestanding uh, property. And uh, now since that time, which has now been 11 years um, since uh, the recession, the Great Recession, uh, I have uh, written about an article every single day for 11 years. Uh, I've written three books. And I just published that third book uh, called The Intelligent Re Investor Guide which uh, got an endorsement from the legendary Sam Zell. So I was really happy to get that. And uh, so that's pretty much the update, Michael. All right. So you've been doing this for a while. You have the experience. And I always think this is an interesting question because nothing in history is always exactly like the current environment, right? People always like to draw parallels. Is there anything about the real estate market today that reminds you of some of the mania phases in the lead up to housing peaking in 06? Right, because I, I, and I don't mean from the standpoint of sort of structural debt and CDOs and and all this stuff. What I'm talking about is really sort of sentiment. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And you know, Michael, one thing I did when I was a developer, I'd go every year out to Las Vegas uh, in May, right around my birthday, which is May the tenth, and I go to this conference called Recon, which still exists, by the way. It's it's uh, sponsored by the International Council of Shopping Centers. It's, it's what I call the Retail Super Bowl. Um, and I remember going out right out of college. I was really fascinated. That was my first trip to Vegas. And I go year after year. And there was all these parties, all these big developers, you know, Simon and Taubman and Kimco and the, and the private developers as well. They would have these huge parties. And I remember going to some parties. I think they had like Aretha Franklin and big limousines and cigars and you name it. And I, over the years, I just started thought, well, wow, this is crazy. I mean, this has got to Where's what's fueling all of this retail growth? You know, and this was probably like 2000, 2001, 2002. You know, so if I would have really sat down and, and, and analyzed the number of shopping centers and malls that were being constructed in the U.S., I could have predicted this black swan. Could have predicted it, but I just didn't slow down. I was too, I was too greedy trying to develop the next shopping center or the net, next net lease property. So I think that would have been a really good barometer is to look at supply and demand, especially in retail, which we know has accelerated up until, up until this latest, call it black swan, the pandemic. And now we've seen now just a huge deceleration in retail. And of course, e-commerce uh, certainly disrupted this entire sector. Now I am going out in May to the, uh, conference. It'll be interesting to see how many people are attending. I'm hearing the numbers look pretty decent now, uh, now that we're starting to recover from, from COVID-19. So it'll be interesting, Michael, but I think that is one thing that I think uh, I could have potentially predicted this great recession had I slowed down and, and saw what was happening in retail. So I've got a stat here that, you know, or at least the summary here that shows that REITs historically have outperformed the S&P 500 in half of the periods where treasury yields were rising, right? So this notion that yields rising is necessarily is bad for REITs is not necessarily fully true. Now, of course, the term outperform is loaded, right? Because, you know, the SP could be down 20 and REITs could be down 15, in which case it's still outperform, but you're still losing money. So I'm curious, Brad, maybe educate the audience here a little bit as far as the different segments of REITs, what REITs tend to do better in rising rate environments, which ones tend to do worse? What, what are you kind of focusing on here? So, you know, in general, you know, rising rates is a reflection of 
uh, the economy improving and can adapt to a rising rate environment. And so when we see what I'm saying here is when you see rates rise, generally speaking, not all property sectors, certainly not all REITs, but generally speaking, broadly speaking, uh, you're going to see rental growth uh, across most major property sectors. And of course, you know what happens when you see rental growth, you see net operating income growth, uh, which means valuations grow, uh, which also means dividends grow, which is certainly a catalyst for income paying stocks. So I think in general, you know, REITs are set really well positioned for this rising rate environment. Second thing I want to say is this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I remember remember what happened uh, in the initial uh, taper tantrum with Bernanke. And we saw a lot of these REITs pull back uh, on sentiment. And especially we saw these net lease REITs, you know, these these companies that I used to build uh, stores for, um, uh, like, you know, Walgreens and Vance Auto and O'Reilly that I just alluded to, um, because those are long term contractual leases, um, the perception is they're not able to adjust uh, in a rising rate environment because rents can't grow as quickly. Obviously, sectors like hotels can adjust rates overnight. Self-storage can adjust rental rates overnight. Um, And many sectors can adjust rates quicker. But the net lease sector uh, specifically, again, this is perception, aren't able to grow because these are long-term leases, typically 10 to 15, even in some cases with some drug stores, 20-year leases. So these are flat leases that can't adjust with rising rates. But again, here's where I want to debunk that myth, especially in net lease, because most net lease properties do grow. They do have um, organic growth built in. Again, I built stores for Vance Auto and Tractor Supply, and those companies have built-in growth, maybe not every year, certainly every five years, you see that growth potential. But that's not what I'm really looking at right now. What really excites me about net lease. And because, again, going back to that first rodeo, I saw what happened with Bernanke. Now we're seeing it now. We're seeing most of these net lease REITs, which also include gaming REITs, by the way, which are just another subcategory of of net lease, which I like that sector a lot. Um, We're seeing all these companies, most all of these net lease companies, pull back again because of that sentiment, that fear that they can't adjust. But what's what's not mentioned and where the media really misses out on that lease is the potential of the high fragmentation of this marketplace, trillions of dollars of, of net lease properties that are scattered not only in the US, but all over the world. We have companies like Realty Income now going into Europe, companies like WP Carey going into Europe. They've been in Europe for a while. Um, so, so you've got the ability to grow these, as long as these net lease companies can continue to grow and consolidate portfolios, uh, you're going to see that external growth engine going to work. And that's what you're seeing right now. The market's missing it. So I think now is a beautiful time to invest in net lease. You know, we're getting ready to start our March Madness Bracketology series, and you're going to see a lot of these net lease REITs. We, nothing but net <laughs> is what we're going to see in net lease because Again, this is a great time to be buying these companies. We think there's going to be a considerable amount of M&A. There already has been a lot of M&A. I think you're going to see more of these um, transactions, both from private to, to public and public to public. Um, so that's really where I see it today, Michael, is, you know, again, this is the market responding to rising rates. That's great. We see that opportunity to allocate capital to those names because of their pricing right now. Let's talk about M and A for a moment because uh, I got a couple of stats here that on, on the REIT space and M and A. So net acquisitions hit a record high. Or REIT net, net acquisitions hit a record high of sixty-seven billion last year. Uh, and you mentioned self-storage REITs; they led the way with seven billion dollars in acquisition activity. Is there anything that you've seen in your experience in your work that would suggest that M and A tends to pick up in within the REIT space towards the beginning of a secular cycle that favors REITs towards the end of a secular cycle? How how should one think about what M&A is a signal of when it comes to the REIT space? Yeah. So, look, I think we we cover the private markets and a lot of these private equity companies as well. By the way, a lot of commercial mortgage REITs we cover like KKR, Blackstone, Starwood, Apollo, Aries, you know, they most of all of them have commercial mortgage REITs. And so that gives us pretty good 
intel on where that capital is allocated. But companies like Blackstone, for example, which, of course, private equity, they do own Blackstone Mortgage, um, or they're advised by Blackstone Mortgage. But black, companies like Blackstone, KKR, um, and um, Brookfield, namely, have really gotten more active in the space. And so it's be creating more and more competition uh, for the REIT. So it's not only the M&A that we're seeing on the, on the public side, uh, companies like Simon and Tallman or Kimco and Weingarten or Realty Income and Vary, and those were all public to public M&A deals. But we're also seeing, you know, these private equity firms picking off, you know, these companies uh, like Cyrus One, which is a data center REIT, uh, and, and many, many others that are out there. So it's, it's, a, it's very competitive. And you're seeing a lot of that capital, again, going in the private side of the, the space. Uh, it's making these public REITs more competitive. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, we're, we're monitoring all of that pretty, pretty closely. But look, I think I think you're going to see a continuation of this. It's it's it's, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, scale in the REIT space, especially in the public REIT space. There's really two levers that really drive returns for investors. First off, and we've touched on, you know, the balance, strength of the balance sheet. Um, you know, the company has to have a, a, a low cost of capital to be able to to invest accretively. Uh, this, after all, re- re- real estate investing is really a spread investing business. So we look at these companies like Simon, like Realty Income, um, like Very, that have tremendous uh, balance sheet or really cost of capital advantage, and then scale. When you combine that to, with scale, you have companies that really can accelerate growth. Again, we, we can go through kind of the textbook of that being Realty Income, who just closed on Very. Uh, they just announced another gaming transaction recently with Win which I think was $1.4 billion. Um, so you're going to see more and more of that. These companies that are the bigger are going to get bigger. And it's really going to flush out a lot of these companies, I believe, in certain sectors. We do think in that lease, we expect to see more M&A. We expect to see more in the healthcare sector, hotel sector, most every sector. We're going to see, I think, more and more consolidation. Again, these companies using their pricing advantages and their scale advantage to continue to generate, um, you know, a, 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 you know, exceptional returns. First off, in terms of preparing for the for the next recession, I think um, you know what we learned from the from the last one. I certainly can speak from experience um, as a developer in two thousand, you know, leading up to the two thousand eight two thousand nine, was the use of leverage. And um, I think many of certainly I I learned. I think many. REIT CEOs and CFOs also learned that um, the best way to prepare or stress test for a recession is to maintain modest leverage. And so we've seen that really over the last 11 years now. Most companies have uh, many, many REITs that were around before 2008-9 have considerably reduced leverage. Uh, they've recycled assets uh, into higher quality assets. And I want to use Kimco is a great example of that. They used to have properties in Latin America and, and really all over, um, but they they decided to uh, really focus more on on major U.S. markets and higher quality necessity based product, uh, i.e., you know, grocery stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, etc. And so, I think what we've seen with with these REITs is I think the deleveraging of balance sheets. You have REITs now that have gotten become more. We see more investment grade ratings. I think I saw this morning Four Corners Property Crust Trust, which is a restaurant focused, primarily with the spinoff of Darden. Um, we've seen them uh, had an upgrade today. I think with S and P or Moody's. I can't remember which rating agency. But you're going to continue to see I think more of that. Uh, really focusing on you know, maintaining that that balance sheet. And again, that all goes back to that competitive advantage being that cost of capital advantage, you know, so the company that can go from, you know, from a, from a double B plus to a triple B minus to a triple B plus to an A minus, you know, they're able to continue to, to drill down and lower that, that cost of capital. So I think that's one area in terms of preparing for the recession. And we're seeing that for most of these REITs, Um, you know, in terms of, of retail, I mean, you know, net lease, the realty income, there was really only maybe two or three net lease REITs. There was national retail properties, there was realty income, and maybe WP Carey, which is a REIT company. Three of the gaming REITs are going to two and should close any, well, I guess in the second quarter, certainly in the first half of this year, we'll see Vici and MGM 
uh, Growth Properties, MGP, uh, merge. Uh, and there'll only be two, the big gaming and leisure properties, uh, which is more regional focus, and, and Vici, which is kind of more dominant trophy assets. Um, but I think you're, you're seeing, again, going back to these net lease, you're seeing a lot of those companies, and you're seeing within these net lease REITs a number of different business models. So companies like Store Capital, which is the Berkshire Hathaway, has an investment in store. Um, you see companies like uh, Spirit. You see companies like a Central Property Trust, EPRT. They tend to be more restaurant focused. They have a, a more uh, exposure to, you know, to restaurants. And as I mentioned, Four Corners Property Trust being the Darden spinoff. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think in terms of, but but again, in terms of restaurants in general, one thing we've learned is that quality really matters. And having, you know, high quality tenants, um, you know, many restaurants really struggled, as, you, as we all know, during the, the uh, pandemic. But companies like Four Corners didn't because they had Darden, which is an investment grade rated company. Uh, and then you have Four Corners being an investment grade rated um, landlord. Uh, they survived extremely well and they collected most all of the rent checks um, during the pandemic. So I think in terms of you know net lease companies, you're going to see more of those companies screen for higher quality tenants. Um, you know, the the, the days of franchise credit is going to be hard, you know, hard to to uh, grasp in the in the in the public space. Um, I used to say I was a franchisee myself. By the way, I used to own uh, multiple uh, Papa John's pizza stores, and I tell my friends, you know, most franchisees, including me, are, were one snowstorm away from going out of business. And so it's it's a very difficult business being a, a franchisee. Um, and so I think in terms of the net lease REIT side, we're, there's really a, a big focus now on the higher quality of the tenant, the sustainability of that rent check um, going forward. So hopefully this answers that question. Um, but, um, you know, I, I do think overall, when I look back at the evolution of the last 10 years, uh, these, these, these REITs are, are much better landlords today in terms of their uh, ability to maintain very strong balance sheets and, again, continue to drive the needle by lowering their cost of capital. From all the studies I've done, REITs are, if you look at sort of the broad-based REIT funds or REIT indices, is there are times when they act like a risk-on part of the marketplace, times when they act like a risk-off part of the marketplace. So the notion of, is there sort of a real true risk-off segment within REITs, I think is, is an interesting one to think through, Brad. You know, I could literally write write a few chapters on, on that topic, but I'll try to keep it brief here. Um, you know, the great thing about REITs, and I say this every day, is because there are so many different categories or property sectors to invest in. You know, again, going back to the evolution of REITs, I mean, back when I was in college and I took real estate classes, I mean, we, we thought we looked at real estate as two very distinct, you know, or, or excuse me, maybe four different distinct asset classes, retail, apartments, um, you know, industrial and now, really, over the last 10 years, uh, with technology really booming and we see uh, companies that uh, uh, really re revolve around technology like data centers and cell towers, um, which is fairly new. These are fairly new companies really into the REIT sector over the last, say, 10 years or so. Uh, and then we see a lot of new categories that are coming to play. And a lot of these are Quasi net lease, they're sell lease back type structures uh, like cannabis, for example. So I want to point out something today, and I thought this was really interesting. Of course, we cover, we actually created our own cannabis sector. I, I know NARI and a lot of companies probably classify cannabis and industrial, but we we decided after the fourth cannabis REIT, and it's actually getting ready to be five cannabis REITs, that includes equity REITs and mortgage. We said, hey, let's just create our own, you know, universe or a property sector for cannabis. Uh, or REIT sector. And this morning we saw IIPR, that's Innovative Industrial Properties, announce a dividend increase. And looking here, I think it was 17% increase in their dividend. And of course, we knew that was coming. We've been watching the company very closely. They've been very successful at acquiring cannabis. These are the higher quality cannabis properties, not greenhouses. They're typically industrial kind of manufacturing or warehousing facilities. Um, and we saw this dividend boost. But then I'm looking at the market right now and shares are down today on a 17% announced dividend increase and shares are down, you know, 2.7% right now. It's like, what, what is, what is going on here? Usually when, you know, is Mr. Market don't understand, you know, when you get a 17% dividend increase, what's, what's going on? But obviously that, that's, you know, certainly 
you know, the cannabis sector in general has gotten its, its own share of risks. Uh, but again, looking at all the facts and figures and the potential safe law that may or may not happen, eventually I think it will happen, which will level the playing field for, uh, for REITs. And in other words, banks will start lending to some operators. Uh, but even in that scenario, we don't see a bankruptcy. Um, but we've seen, you know, these cannabis REITs really sell off really over the last um, year or so. Um, and that's an area we really like because, again, we're value investors. We look for companies that are beaten down, that are high quality. And uh, IIPR certainly, uh, you know, fits that, fits that bill. Um, I, I mentioned the gaming sector before. That's another sector that, again, Mr. Market really doesn't quite grasp. I mean, I, I like to use this analogy a lot and compare, you know, a, a, a property like, let's call it the Venetian Resort, which I think I've stayed there once or twice in Vegas. Uh, that just closed, by the way, Vici just acquired that, that property in the sale leaseback. And compare owning like a, you want to own a Venetian or do you want to own like maybe, a, you know, a thousand dollar general stores, uh, which may equate to the same thing. And so when I look at the underlying real estate of, say, like, a, you know, one of these trophies like Beachy owns, you know, Caesars Palace or Venetian or MGM, which they'll close very soon. Um, you know, these are these are these are companies. These are buildings that cost, you know, hundred million dollars and they're they're massive. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a vacancy when I've gone to Las Vegas with these properties, even through recessions. And so when you look at the quality of that real estate and compare that to, say, a Dollar General, which I used to build those, I mean, they're, you know, but when a Dollar General goes dark, you know, which does happen, especially in these tertiary markets, they'll move around. Uh, do you really want to own that company? Do you re- are you going to get the same rent out of that facility? And then you ask yourself, what about, you know, Caesars Palace? Do you see that going vacant? And, and that's kind of how we think about it in terms of the net lease, uh, the gaming sector. Because they're certainly trading at a at a discount to their direct peers in the net lease sector, which would be companies like Realty Income. So again, I like that sector because we're seeing that sentiment, and, and I don't see that. Even though again, we see the sentiment there, the fundamentals are, are quite the opposite of that. And I'll also move over to the healthcare sector. Healthcare is is really an extension of net lease. So most of these healthcare um, assets are you know, by broad definition, net lease, whether it be a hospital like Medical Property Trust, and we, we like that company. It's a very critical asset. Uh, it's performed well during the pandemic because, frankly, you got to get, you, it's a necessity. People need to go to these hospitals, unfortunately, and um, all the time. And so we love the hospital space because of that attraction to that, you know, that necessity component. We can say the same thing for medical office buildings, which are also everybody's got to go to the doctor. Telemedicine is not going to, you know, be the one all one stop shop, you know. And so those are categories. Again, a lot of these are net lease, longer duration leases. But again, they're they're very sustainable. Uh, and they the, the big thing that I think is important to, to recognize here, for whether it's a REIT or not a REIT, because we cover our company covers a, a, a pretty large universe of dividend growth stocks or dividend paying stocks, but I think dividend growth. And so we're still seeing, again, even inflation or not, and this is why REITs are so great to own in this type of environment, because we're seeing these dividends continue to grow. And I think we're going to see some very strong performance coming out of this because just finished up. I think we've got a couple more names left in uh, earnings, last earnings, earnings quarter, fourth quarter. But for the large part, most of these companies are continuing to generate uh, very impressive uh, earnings growth. Now, one sector we are watching, which is which is highly uh, uh, secular, is the hotel industry. I'm working on an update today of all of the hotel REITs, and we think hotel REITs are really interesting. Could represent what we saw in retail last year with the outperformance of shopping center REITs, not least REITs, and and malls. We think that in terms of valuations today for hotels and how much of a discount that we see today, we think that's really an area that we're going to really start allocating capital for investors, both hotels and again, healthcare. So just remember the two H's, hotels and healthcare, they seem to be beaten down pretty hard. And I think, you know, the, the fundamentals are there to support uh, the companies continuing to to move forward. Uh, so I think overall, I mean, manufactured housing, we've got a lot of sectors that have really been priced in manufactured housing, multifamily, those perform extremely well 
in 2021, and they're continuing to grow. But again, we don't see a whole lot of value in those sectors. Uh, one, one category I do want to m- put, touch on, though, is the t- we call the technology uh, sector, which is the data center and the cell tower sector. So companies like Digital Realty uh, have, have traded down. Uh, now, they're not going to produce the same uh, or, or growth that we witnessed over the last, say, 10 years or so. Uh, but I think we, we certainly see the the valuation in this, what we call blue chip company, their investment grade. They've increased the dividend every single year since it went public. Uh, it's companies like Digital Realty look very attractive today. American Tower in the cell tower space also looks very attractive today. Um, so there's, again, going back to, there's a great universe of stocks or REITs to select from uh, trying to find out you know, which of those companies uh, are going to generate, you know, the best risk-adjusted returns uh, in this type of environment. I think is critical. And again, our focus is really on quality, and and we evaluate each company and we screen each company based on uh, the quality of of their of their business model, the quality of their management team, and obviously that is all of that is correlated to the growth of earnings and the growth of dividends. The I guess in terms of quality, so we we put together our, our quality scoring model, and we screen for companies using a quality and evaluation scoring model. So zero to one hundred, one hundred's best quality, and uh, in terms of value, one hundred would be the cheapest quality, cheapest uh, excuse me, cheapest value. So we put together this x y axis, and then we can we post all our REITs on a on a on a chart to see. Uh, we'd like to see that top right corner of companies that have the highest quality. And the best value, and those are in that order. We look for quality first. So, in terms of in terms of overall quality, again, I kind of go back to what I said earlier with with regard to those two wide mode advantages, the cost of capital. So, really dissecting that balance sheet pretty closely, making sure the company has uh, uh, the payout ratio is really huge. And so, we we overweight our our the the, the payout ratio to our quality score. Um, we, th- we look at, a. I think we've got seven different uh, kind of what we call balance sheet metrics that, in- that makes up our quality score. And the one that we overweight the most is that payout ratio. Um, that's a pretty good indicator uh, for us. Remember, REITs uh, must pay out 90% of taxable income. That's one of the, one of the laws uh, for REITs, whereas C-Corps don't. And so um, we think, you know, this, this is a really important uh, area for us to always maintain. And we look at the AFFO, uh, which, which is the purest form of free cash flow, which really gives us a pretty good signal in terms of the strength of that dividend. And now, remember, a lot of the different property sectors, are, they're unique because uh, certain sectors don't require the same uh, level of CapEx or, or, or leasing commissions as, um, as per some other sectors. So for example, in net lease, uh, these are long-term leases, so generally they're not being re- recycled or, or um, redeveloped uh, every year or five years. So a net lease REIT can can arguably pay out a higher d- dividend uh, uh, on an AFFO basis than, say, an office uh, REIT who has a lot, large ongoing amount of CapEx and leasing costs uh, built into the business model. So... Um, but we look at very closely, I mean, quality really comes down to that dividend because the, the worst thing a company can do is cut that dividend. You know, that's the, that's the very worst thing. And, um, and again, we look at this not only for REITs, but the other sectors. But that is in terms of our quality system and how we analyze REITs, uh, we do look very closely. And frankly, we've avoided so many traps because and we've had a lot of our uh, subscribers avoid uh, traps because uh, we saw those dividends. Uh, were not sustainable. In fact, you know, going into the pandemic, we were underweight. Uh, in fact, we had holds and sells on most of the mall REITs. I think Simon and Tanger were probably the only ones we were really recommending. And even at that level, we were looking at it very speculatively because we recognized even before the pandemic that the mall sector in the U.S. was extremely overbuilt with 1,400 or so malls located across the country. I like to use an example of my hometown mall is owned by CBL. I've always felt like, you know, there was too many malls and about a population of about a million people. But what we found out is that Simon does own better malls, better properties, they're better locations, they're higher quality, they have higher, uh, uh, better department store exposure, Um, the demographics are much more favorable. 
Um, and so that's one reason we've maintained our buy and still maintain a buy on Simon, because uh, not only in terms of the quality of the balance sheet, the discipline of the management team. Yes, Simon did was forced to cut the dividend in the pandemic, as many REITs did. But we look at what, how they've adapted to that since that time. And so I think in terms of the quality, we would score a company like Simon very high because of the strength of that balance sheet. The fact they are the dominant player in that sector. And we like to own those dominant names in, in those sectors like Simon or like Realty Income, for example, and the net lease space. So in terms of avoidance and quality, I, mean, I think that's really an important part of it. We like to see internal, internally managed companies versus externally managed companies. Uh, now, in the commercial mortgage REIT space, that's the exception because most of those are managed by private equity firms. But certainly in the equity REIT side of the business, we like to see companies that are uh, that are uh, internally managed. Uh, we like to see that alignment of interest. I think that's extremely critical. And we've done a lot of research looking at companies that are externally managed and some things that aren't, ex- aren't, aren't internally managed. Uh, now, again, there's always exceptions. And typically a company that's a billion dollars or less in market cap, they can't afford to have a full-time G&A structure. But what we do, uh, you know, still recommend those types of names, but we really look closely at, at, at those metrics as well. So uh, looking at that whole quality perspective, uh, you know, in terms of like companies that we call sucker yields uh, or yield traps, uh, you know, there there's quite a few out there. Um, and I certainly uh, usually provide kind of this what I call the ugly duckling list. I'm doing a swan article now, which is our sleep well at night uh, uh, article. I think we just published that last week and I'm doing one today on the swan of bees, which the swan being these companies that that could be swans or what we call sleep well at night uh, companies. And then finally, I'm going to close this out with a series on the ugly ducklings, which are these are the companies that just aren't cutting it for, for whatever reason. Their, their leverage is high. Their dividend payout show, ratio is high. They, they're diverse, they don't have enough diversification in their portfolio um, and really scanning for those companies that we want to avoid. And I think risk avoidance is really a big part of what we try to do. Um, I would rather steer people away from a and from a bad investment and steer into a good investment. Uh, and we, we try to, we, we, you know, we try to do a lot of that. Um, now in terms of ESG, you know, we, certainly, I mean, this is a big, big, uh, a big thing, big consideration right now. And i see a lot of these REITs that are, um, you know, adjusting to, um, to this new paradigm that you have to be, have, uh, a lot of focus on ESG. Um, I did see recently, I was interviewing, um, a CEO, I think it was with a cannabis REIT, um, and I've, I've been, I try to interview a CEO at least once a week. And those are questions I like to ask. And most of all these, all the, you know, management teams have really, um, have really, uh, become more focused on ESG. And, uh, I think that is a, that is going to be a really critical part thing going forward. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of boards transform lately, um, to be more balanced in their, uh, board constitu- constituency. Um, and I think that's going to be, uh, uh, definitely a continued focus, uh, in the REIT space. I will tell you, um, you know, my oldest daughter, I've got five children, four girls and a boy. Uh, so they're outnumbered us, but, um, my oldest daughter works for CNBC. Uh, her name's Lauren Thomas. And I was talking to her, uh, about, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, just about, there just didn't seem to be as many women serving on bank boards. Uh, in the REIT space, but I, I will tell you, over the last two to three years, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, changes made and a lot more uh, uh, women involved in the REIT sector, which is great. Uh, I'll also say that I think two of the best CEOs that we cover uh, are women. Uh, that would be Deborah Kafaro at Ventas, ticker BTR, and Wendy Simpson at LTC. Both are healthcare REIT CEOs, and they're doing a great job. And of course, uh, Store Capital is now run by Mary Fedewa, uh, uh, who's doing a great job there. And we just upgraded her, upgraded the company to a buy here in the fourth quarter. First of all, first thing, I, first thing that comes to mind, top of mind, is that's exactly why I own Digital Realty. And that's exactly why I own American Tower and Crown Castle, because that is the fuel, literally, for this technology. You know, they've gotta, you've got to have storage, data storage for that product. Um, so, you know, the more I hear that conversation, the more I want to buy digital realty and companies like, like digital realty in terms of the actual, you know, consumer experience, you know, IE gas stations. 
I've actually asked this question to a number of CEOs um, over the years. I think the last time I spoke, uh, I think I asked Chris Volk, who's no longer with Store, but he was one of the co-founders of Store Capital. And I, asked, I think I asked him, that I don't think Store owns a lot of convenience stores. They may, know, own, they may not have any, but Chris is, is always a really, he's gifted at, at, at underwriting credits and net lease. I think one of the best. And I asked him, I think that same question. And it, it was something like, you know, I think, you know, the ma- large majority of those sales are going to come from, you know, inside the store, the, you know, the candy, the, you know, the whatever, whatever's you buy inside of a convenience store. But uh, that is certainly what gets people to the store. They got to fill up the gas tank and, and get people into that parking lot. And I think that's a, that's a certainly a valid question. Uh, there's a, there's a pure play company we cover called Getty. Uh, GTY that owns, uh, they started out as their sole tenant being Getty, and now they've diversified into other operators. And, you know, I, 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 that's in it. But then, and, and this company has continued to diversify into fast food. And so you're seeing, I think, this, and I think we've been seeing this shift of it's not just the gas station, maybe it's the gas station and the Burger King on the side uh, and, and other things that are going to bring in um, the traffic. Uh, to the business outside of that. Yeah, I think you've seen companies like Kimco even starting to put in these uh, these charging facilities. Um, you know, I would even, I was talking to somebody, I don't know, it was, it's been recently, and they're like, well, why hasn't there been a, like a, a REIT that just does these uh, electronics stations? I thought, you know, that's that's probably on the horizon. I would not be surprised to see, you know, that type of scale uh, in which you have these charging facilities, and that's you know that's that's actually becoming a, a new uh, a new uh, asset class or a new a new property sector, I should say. Um, so I think that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, I I don't I haven't driven one yet. I certainly want to drive one. I I live literally five minutes from BMW's North American uh, manufacturing facility. We're kind of the the, the little Detroit here with all the, we've got Michelin here as well and a number of, of uh, suppliers. So it's really going to be interesting. And I also say we've got in, in my hometown, a U.S. Postal Service just uh, signed a contract. We'll be building uh, the state-of-the-art uh, electric uh, U.S. Postal Service facilities. I forget how many jobs are, are going to be created here. It's going to be massive. Uh, and by the way, we cover postal realty, which is the post office REIT. So again, you just can't get away from real estate. Uh, but I think you that's a great question, and I think that's one that has to be uh, has to be uh, uh, you know thought about uh, quite a bit um, as we as as technology has advances. We also cover a number of prop tech companies in our platform at iReit, and it's really amazing to see the number of uh, companies that are that are uh, advancing technology in real estate uh, through these innovation uh, practices. So. I think you always got to consider that. But again, it always makes me feel glad to be a shareholder in these in the cell tower and the data center. We're seeing rates. I mean, I don't want to, especially in the green. I've seen some of these green bonds just, you know, sub 2% money. I mean, it's it's really amazing to see. I never would have thought that being a developer for you know, 25 years before I became a writer, you know, the the cost of capital. This is why this is why the public REITs have their primary competitive advantage. I would hate to go toe to toe you know, competing uh, for a customer or property uh, with the, these types of balance sheets. Um, and again, not all of them have a rated. There's only maybe a dozen that have a rated balance sheets, but, you know, you got a lot of investment grade rated companies out there. And, um, you know, they, they, they've got, like you said, they, they'll price a, you know, a 10 year unsecured at, you know, two, you know, just over a two handle. Um, you take that, equity multiple, you know, real incomes at weighted average cost of capital is like 4%. And they'll go transact like they did, they announced last week with Win at a 5.9%, 190 basis points. That does have bumps every five years. Um, and these things are just growing and growing. They're not bonds. They're not bonds. But the market's pricing them that way. That's fine. Let the market keep pricing them, but we'll keep buying them. Um, and so that's kind of my view of it. I think, um, you know, it's uh, you just you know you just can't compete with these companies. They're dominant and they'll continue. And by the way, re, I guess last point, you know, REITs own about ten percent of all institutionally owned real estate in the U.S. So look at all that opportunity for fragmentation and consolidation. Show me any other any other asset class where you can go say, hey, I can 
look at all this pipeline of opportunity out there. So it's it's significant. Um, and so I think that's REITs are here here to stay. Uh, REITs have been around since 1960, and I think they're going to be around for quite a bit longer. So uh, it's a great time to get into it. And like I said, I'm, we're really bullish in that lease. That sector sold off really hard, and I think that's really where the opportunities exist right now. I've written about this a lot. Uh, in this article I read, I think it was in National Real Estate Investor, the answer, the title article was called The Answer is Nine. Now, this, this article was probably written in maybe the early 80s, I think, 1980s, 82, 83. And, and it goes about, the, 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 the author wrote about, he was a Harvard professor um, who taught every year, and he would tell his students at the beginning of each class, he put up the number nine on the on the t- on this on the uh, chalkboard, and the students would look at him and say, "What do you what do you what is that?" And he said, "Well, this is the answer to your exam question, and and it is essentially the average cap rate. Think about this now: the average cap rate of all commercial real estate going back, you know, over many many decades." So I, I, every now and then I'll write an updated article, and I'll say, "Well, you know, the answer is no longer nine. You know, is it eight? Is it seven? Is it six? I mean, you know, and I'm talking average cap rate for all property sectors, you know, cannabis on down. And so, you know, we can go to some of the higher cap rate sectors, like you mentioned cannabis, which is somewhere in the 12, 13, 14 percent. Skilled nursing's up there, nine, 10 percent. We've seen a little compression in skilled nursing, which is a good thing for companies like Omega Healthcare Investors. Um, but then we've seen industrial transactions. I mean, I can't believe some of the some of the trades we're seeing you know, on the industrial side, sub 4% deals. And then in medical office buildings is another sector. I've just just scratched my head thinking, you know, I I didn't know, you know, MOBs could get to the low fives, even sub sub five in some some markets. So it's really interesting to see. And I think we're definitely going to see, you know, cap rates definitely should go up. I mean, if going back to the answer is nine, now we're not going to go back to nine. Uh, but if you take across all of those property sectors, um, you know, I think you're going to see definitely some adjustments there in terms of pricing. And so um, that's something we're very cognizant of, because that is obviously what what's going to drive valuations uh, for the real estate sector going forward. Uh, but I really don't see, you know, any sudden I mean, right now today, I mean, I don't see any any sudden movement. Um, and again, kind of going back to your point on the private side, I mean, you know, I think we're seeing a, a, so much money moving into this private sector that it's, it's been, it's really been very competitive. We've interviewed like the CEO recently of Stag Industrial, Ben Butcher, and he was talking about, I can't remember the specific deal, but, you know, he was chasing private equity uh, money to buy whatever we were talking about. And he said, look, I, I couldn't be competitive and there's no way. You know, I could go in and buy a deal today at a at a you know at a four percent cap rate. So you know, kind of how cap rates play up in this right in this rising rate environment. I do think we'll see cap rates move up in certain sectors. Um, but overall, I mean, it's obviously you know the it's the chase for yield, and what's happening is all these um, investors, all these retirees, are really you know plowing money into the into the space looking for looking for yield. I think we'll see cap rates come up definitely uh, for sure. I don't see a whole, you know, I don't see them going up very quickly uh, anytime soon. Yeah, no, no. Great insight. Again, if everybody that's joined, please make sure you follow Brad Thomas and make sure you check out my pin tweet daily as I bring on different guests. Uh, thank you, Brad, for joining for the hour plus here. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. Hopefully you got some good followers out of it. And everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Uh-huh.